Um, I will try. Can I? I almost hit leave meeting. It said it said got it or or I, so I, I hit got it. Got the right one. So um, I'll do my best. And and I hope Ron and Matt. I remembered that this was a slide from the last time we did this. And I wanted to bring this up that there are many sources who provide funding as either for the analysis. I mean, they're not generally going to buy software for companies, but they will provide help with assessments, maybe help with training, help with consulting to get things better. And this is a list of them. And for anybody in, in the audience, you know, I'm happy to, to uh, provide this slide deck. So, you know, don't feel uh, that you have to scribble all these down, but. Uh, yep. uh, yeah, so Scott, I appreciate you bringing that yeah. up. Um, in, in particular, if you are going through an ERP transition, a lot of the training can be covered either through SBDC or Ohio TechCred. Yeah. Some of it may depend on which tool you use because there needs to be an accredited training program for that tool. Right. But most of the common ones, you know, are, are covered. So it's definitely, something to consider if uh, you're thinking about making some changes. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I, I would venture a strong guess that half of our clients right now, and I think some of it was just due to COVID relief and whatnot, but are getting some funding from some NGO or true government agency for, for an ERP initiative that we're helping with. And it really helps offset some of our fees. Um, so it's nice. So. I wanted to begin the day with a discussion that we have really evolved this practice around, and it was James Harrington's quote, and he, he wrote the book, uh, Business Process Improvement, and, it, and that is, measurement is the first step that leads to control and eventually to improvement. If you can't measure something, you can't understand it. If you can't understand it, you can't control it, and if you can't control it, you can't improve it. And that was a very eloquent way of saying what a, um, and I guess I'll use his name now because he's, he's uh, subsequently retired and sold the business to, I believe it's now KKR. But if you're familiar with Betcher Industries, Larry Betcher um, gave me a much more colorful language 21 years ago when he's out at Betcher Industries, when he said, I know if the, if the machines that I've invested in are running because I get machine utilization graphs, I see them running, I see my operators using them, but these blankety blank ERP systems are the other way, other end of the spectrum. Um, he said, all I know is that I was told they, the software vendor, told me my inventory turns would increase from two to four or six, and now they're down to one. And they've obviously in the last 20 years greatly improved that, but this, he really gave us the impetus for what you're gonna see next. And as we talked with him about it, we realized that there's a, he kept focusing on utilization and that's really what gave us the idea for an entire practice area. Um, that's why I love to say I learned from my, as much from our clients as we do from, as they do from us. And we knew we couldn't use time as the unit of measure for utilization. So we used features, requirements, required features. And so just in these broad areas related to manufacturing and materials management, because I'm not sure that the term supply chain had been coined back in 2001, we had identified that his group of people needed 137 items, 137 features, and their software only supported 102 of them for what we would call a 74% fit or effectiveness. However, what we found was they were actually only using 70 of the 102. So depending on which you want to put as the denominator, the 102, which should be the maximum, there um, would be a 69% utilization, 51% if you use the big number as the, uh, the uh, denominator. And he was really impressed with this. And what we did with this with his company for about three or four years, helped them close some of these gaps and turn on some of these late, the 32 missing features develop some custom software and bolt-ons to fill these 35 that were missing. But ultimately, um, they gave up on, on that and in 2006 or seven, replaced it with a full-blown ERP system that was a best-in-class, better fit. Um, we, sim we did a similar well, engagement. Hey, Scott, I wonder if we could maybe just slide in a little survey yeah, please, <clears throat> before please. we get too far. Yeah, go ahead. And while you're so, doing that, Go ahead. There we go. So we have um, 
our flash poll. So if you guys wouldn't mind filling in, and I'm and I'm going to participate as well. <clears throat> so you just need to click and submit. All right. So, so don't have got... one yet, and and a couple that have you know more than three years, and and the the ones in the more than three years category um, are often the case, uh, like I showed there with Betcher, and and they they've not minded me sharing their name. This other one here is from a client that was literally had earmarked a half a million half yes half a million dollars for a new system and hired us to help them go on a, as a, as a marriage arranger or a dating service to help them find the best system for them. As we dug into it, what we found as we were identifying the requirements, and this was an end-to-end -end business wide study, we identified 1100 plus requirements. We found that the current system, if they just bought a couple of more modules could fulfill 950 of them for an 84% fit, which is a nice solid B, uh, gentleman's B back in the day. But notice they were only using 445 of that 948. Their, their level of utilization was under, under 50%. And when we exposed this to the president, we said, you don't need new software. You need to it, um, have some enforcement mechanisms, some controls to better use what you've got. Some of these requirements that were supported were modules that they didn't own, but they did. So they did end up spending about 100, 150,000 on additional modules, training, education, whatnot. But um, they saved or avoided somewhere in the neighborhood of 350 to 400,000 in costs by just us exposing to them that their current system was a pretty adequate uh, solution for them. And as of the last time I checked, which was right before COVID, they had taken our advice, stayed with that current system another decade. This, this study we did was in the 2010-11 timeframe. So, um, you know, these go back. And so what I wanted to do was show you how we help companies with a seven-step roadmap for enterprise software improvement. I use the label or acronym ERP a lot, but all of these principles apply to CRM, WMS, um, any kind of acronym related to software, but um, ERP is kind of the most generic. So, so you'll see that strewn throughout. But I, do have, the, Scott, do we have time for another poll? Please, yes, please go ahead. All right, Ann. All right. All right. Good. Uh, so whenever you want to fit them in, Scott, just call them out and we'll get another yeah, poll yeah. popped up. Yeah. And this, I think, you know, for those that are very satisfied, um, you maybe fall into when we get to the end, what we call the continuous improvement model. Um, for those that are neutral, maybe you aren't sure, don't know. Um, and what we'll do is say, you know, we'll, I'll let you, the sometimes the answer is we don't know whether we don't know what we don't know. So we'll we'll definitely um, give you some tools to talk about that. Um, our seven step roadmap is the six. It's kind of plan your work, work your plan, develop your strategy, design your business processes. Or first, define your goals and objectives. Why are we here? Improving your use of your ERP or CRM system is not. That's a means, what is the end? We're trying to serve customers better, reduce costs, uh, build a scalable business for growth, whatever those things are, that's what we mean there, not improving the use of our system. Then we wanna make sure that there's alignment between what you have or what you might buy and those your business strategy. Then we get into the nitty gritty. How, do our, how does our business function and what does our software need to do in order to support those business processes? And 
Then and only then can we measure the fit and utilization of the current software. Um, that's at which point then we can make some decisions, kind of get to the fork in the road. And depending on which way we go may um, be determined by the costs and potential benefits that come that we want to understand before we start closing the functionality and utilization gaps. In fact, and I'm going to provide an example here where we got through step five with a client um, back in, oh, last October, last fall sometime. And the idea was to go forward and improve their use of their current system until we determined the costs. And the costs were going to be outrageous due to some changes in the software vendor, some the fact that they didn't own many of the optional modules, and the difficulty in finding consultants who were high priced. And so ultimately, when we put a price tag on it, they were going to be spending 150000 to retrofit an old system. And they opted at this point, at that point, to bypass step seven in terms of closing the gaps and said, we'd rather spend 300000 on a new system than 150 on an old one. And that was rare for us, but it does happen. So, so again, starting off always with your goals and, and objectives, uh, Stephen Covey said, begin with the end of, end in mind. And these are some tools that we start clients with to just get the juices flowing. How can customers be better served? How can costs or expenses be reduced? Um, how can we increase employee productivity such that we can increase our revenue without commensurate headcount increase? Um, how might other stakeholders benefit? Um, here's a sample just in the spirit of time I'm not going to read through all of these, but you get the idea. We're big fans of smart, smart objectives, specific, measurable, achievable, uh, relevant, and time-based. Um, so, but some of them may not be numeric. You know, gain better insights into and reporting and costs and margins. These were all taken from actual client project uh, uh, charter statements. Um, second thing is develop an ERP strategy. For our purposes, most of our projects with clients are very tactical and operational. So this is not a big, you know, develop a three ring binder. This is a couple of hour exercise. And it's really just making sure that we, that as a business that you understand your, how your various strategies align with your business strategy and that the enterprise software strategy aligns with both of those. Examples of those that we come across with often are fitment versus customization. A, a, a well-fitting, non-customized, out of the box, you know, we don't tailor our blue jeans when we go buy blue jeans. We just buy the size that fits us and start using them. That's appropriate if you want a low cost, no muss, no fuss experience versus we do run into companies that can warrant and justify doing some degree of custom development. So these are the spectrums that we uh, look at our clients with and, and as part of. So for example, if we hear them saying that they're competing on thin margins and that they're a low price provider, we're gonna try and talk them out of having the latest and greatest, most expensive and most customizable system and try and push them more towards a plain vanilla experience. If we hear that they differentiate themselves from their competition on customer service and responsiveness, we're likely to promote strong CRM or in high, weights on CRM and customer facing applications. If they think they've got better mousetraps, um, a la like a Betcher Industry who is a, a, a world-class manufacturer of their products, we would lean that and push them towards strong product lifecycle management, strong engineering change control, strong configure price quote. Uh, again, sorry for all the three letter acronyms. Um, also looking at the supply chain models, are they engineered to order? That's going to have some impact on the features that the software provides versus a make to stock or a distribution uh, orientation. Um, on the technology continuum, you know, are they a follower or more of an innovator? Um, Fitment I already discussed. It's rare that we have clients do completely custom software, but certainly some modules or some areas of the software we do see done custom. More often it's tailoring something that exists, but we really do try to, unless there's compelling reasons, can we do use things out, off the shelf like uh, blue jeans? Um, and then once you've got that, that 
uh, goals and objectives and strategy, then you can build the business case. You know, will improved use of ERP or CRM better enable us to meet customer demands? Or how will they do that? Do our employees waste time looking for information? That's a, an opportunity to improve productivity. So again, I'll leave you with these, with these as a leave behind as part of the presentation, um, but these are all um, discovery that we do at a very high level um, early in an engagement with a client or we suggest in an educational experience that companies should do themselves. So the takeaway is decide on these big picture factors early. These are strategically important for a, a normal size, typical engagement for ours. This is a half a day to a, a full day exercise. This is not something that you need to spend weeks or months on. There's no right or wrong answers, but what they do is they save time and argument in subsequent steps by providing guidance. So once you've got the, the goals and objectives, the strategy, then we can get into the business processes. This is an area that we see many clients already doing and already at some form of a journey, if it's a Lean Six Sigma journey, if it's, but we do find many manufacturing companies want this type of skill set as a core competency. And that is building things like cross-functional process maps, value stream maps, uh, single threaded process flow diagrams, whatever the appropriate tool is, we're big fans of either clients doing for themselves or us doing with them some form of process mapping engagement to map out the current state. And here's some examples of a current state return goods process. And just the concept of getting a return, um, returning goods to a vendor. We've rejected a delivery and now we're gonna uh, generate, or, or this is actually our customer gen rejected a delivery now we've got to generate some sort of manual invoice or what have you. So this was a current state for a client of ours that manufactures pet food. Um, this was an, uh, for a formula or packaging change, kind of an engineering change control process. You can see that executives are involved, customer service is involved, packaging design is involved, the formulation department is involved, production QA. So um, these tend to expose and make bring to life how complicated some businesses are. The purpose of this is to, to not just to identify how do things work and op provide an opportunity to standardize, but also to, to highlight if there's anything that's non-value added, eliminate it. And if there's anything that's value added or non-value added, but necessary, such as some sort of inspection operation that is mandated by a customer, See what can be done to automate that or data collection. Maybe it's not value added, but it's necessary. So we wanna automate that to the greatest degree as possible. Um, once you've got your processes well-defined, they can be process maps, maybe they're your quality system documents. Then the next step is to go into what we, we call a requirements definition. And requirements definition occur in many initiatives, we suggest four where this should be a mandatory exercise. One is an upgrade from a prior version to a new version, um, whether it's an upgrade or a major kind of re-implementation. Um, any kind of system extension to other plants or related companies. Do that study. Again, me, uh, uh, you know, measure twice, cut once. Um, if you're doing a replacement, of course, you want to go through a requirements analysis. And then sometimes if you're just doing a, an audit, um, we promote auditing ERP utilization, a la kind of the way we, we developed in concert with Betcher Industries 20 years ago, as something that you would do as often as you do a quality system audit for your ISO certification, maybe every couple of years, just do a fit and gap assessment to see if people are actually using the system as designed or are they backsliding and using Excel. Um, this is a list of topics we suggest that you go through uh, the, those that are in black are most commonly found in manufacturing or distribution ERP systems. Those in red are often found in standalone systems or in enterprise resource planning systems. These two up here in red in the upper left are often found in CRM systems, asset maintenance, as well as fixed asset accounting you might find in what are called CMMS, computerized maintenance management systems, or I've heard them called enterprise asset management systems. 
Um, Post-sale service, case and help desk, often also part of CRM. And then we do run into several companies that have adopted a standalone best-in-class uh, scheduling system. Uh, there's one called Protected Flow that we've got a client implementing right now. There's another one, um, uh, Waterloo's Tactic that we've had clients run. So oftentimes there's, there's uh, standalone scheduling systems. I probably should make sales forecasting. Uh, we've seen that as, uh, put that in red as well. Um, our suggestions are that any topic or which tends to correspond to one of those a module should be able to elicit 50 to 250 uh, requirements relating to the setup of your master files and your transactional elements. Um, they should be able to be distilled from your future state process flow diagrams. And especially anything that you weight highly, we must have this, we must have this. What goal or objective is it in support of? For example, if one of the goals is to improve uh, the aggregate uh, ma uh, management of inventory levels, you know, reduce our inventory to sales ratios or whatever, maybe many of the requirements in MRP or demand planning um, could be related to those goals. Um, suggest using relative weights, high, medium, low, three, two, one, whatever. Um, put some, end up putting numeric. Um, and then, especially for anything that's highly weighted, we require our consultants to define why. What is What's the impetus? What's the basis? What's the opportunity for improvement? Um, great ways to get this kind of input. What do we need? Uh, certainly want your visionary employees and your change agents, certainly those with outside experience. If you've hired someone from the outside, grab their knowledge from what they might have done at, at other uh, companies. Um, but you don't want to avoid the skeptics. We all have companies or people in our company that are um, prefer the status quo. They may be a little resistant to change, skeptical of, of new ways of doing things. You want to involve them because they, their adherence to current practices may help you uh, uh, from going too fast and, and into a ditch. And certainly you want to get executive involvement. They may not know much about the number crunching, but they're certainly helpful in making sure that you don't spend too much time on minutia. Um, and can keep the things guided, uh, focusing on the biggest bang for the buck. Um, here's, again, I wanted to leave as part of this presentation. Here's some examples of requirement statements, multiple costing methods within a, pl within a plant, because we've got one product line that uh, fits with standard costing and another product line that fits with act, uh, actual costing. Or we want to schedule our scheduling uh, tool should group like work together because the paint line needs to be sequenced by color or we want to sequence our press operations by uh, raw material type. All kinds of, of reasons to justify a requirement. Forecasting with a seasonality model because we sell to the construction uh, market that's busy in the summer and not as busy in the winter, whatever the reason might be. Um, good time to do another survey question, Matt, or should I Keep slugging forward. No, nope, that sounds good. Good. Um, also, technological requirements. Um, it's these are these are projects that, in our view, they're business projects that involve technology. But we certainly do want to consider things like the user interface, query and reporting tools, and business analytics, uh, personalization and customization tools, and workflow management. This has become. Um, almost table stakes these days. 20 years ago, when I got started in this, workflow was novel. Today, we see most of our clients mandating some ability to be notified, to manage approvals, all those kind of things. Um, we're seeing less and less interest in things like network operating system and databases as we move to the cloud, but that deployment model is certainly something that you want to take a look at as part of an upgrade or what have you. So how do we go about the, the requirements building process? Um, companies can do it yourself. Um, I would suggest avoiding a blank sheet of paper, though the nice thing about a blank sheet of paper is you're not conforming to any box, but there are online checklists and templates that uh, fit various industries and will help you get started. Um, consultant facilitators, um, I'd recommend Mead and More, of course, but we know we have competition that's 
certainly worthy out there. Um, they're going to bring experience. They may bring an online knowledge base, and they may have their own proprietary tools. So, um, you know, uh, so certainly the, we we hope would would bring some value there. Um, you want to review those business processes that are supported by your current systems, but often we will tell you that's the easy part. The more where you want to really spend the time in the investigation is what are we doing outside the system in scheduling, in accounts payable, in receiving? What are we doing in custom software? Where did we generate custom reports? What are we doing in spreadsheets? Um, one of the consultants jokes is always that ERP doesn't stand for enterprise resource planning. It actually stands for Excel, replace, Excel replacement program. And the reason for that is if, if someone is frustrated or doesn't know how to use or isn't comfortable with their ERP system, you will see them getting the job done with Excel spreadsheets or access databases or manual logbooks. We still see a lot of logbooks in the shipping dock and the receiving dock. So certainly include the basics, but spend a lot of time on what's unique to your business. Once you've identified the requirements, then it's time to build a scorecard. And that scorecard is to ex expose the fit of the software and then the level of utilization and adoption by your user community. Um, so what you want to do is for every requirement and whatever it's been weighted, define if and how it's supported by the current system. Is it fully supported out of the box? Did you have to do, do some light tailoring, some medium customization, or some extensive modification to get it done? Did you buy some embedded partner add-on? Did you bolt on something like Salesforce or uh, uh, tactic scheduling? Um, and so, you know, the degree of yes, I guess, or it's not supported. We need that feature. We don't have it. That's why we're contemplating an upgrade or a new system. If it is supported, then define how well, define if and how well it's utilized. Um, depending on the client and their level of, of Socratic inquiry, we sometimes default to a simple yes, no. They're either using it or they aren't. And if they're not using it well, it's a no, no partial credit. We've got other clients where we'll work and we'll put in a, a letter grade. So um, either approach works, um, but we tend to go with a simple yes, no. Um, and then it's a matter of just calculating. I'm not gonna read the, the formulas here for you. It's there if you want the uh, copy of the presentation, but the fit, is, the, the requirements are the, the denominator. The fit is the potential of the system. How many yeses does it have in terms of capability? And the utilization is that portion of the fit that's actually being used. So it's easy to understand. Um, and there's the formulas. And so what I wanted to show you was a couple of sample reports from a, a local, very small company, family held um, business over in the east side that we worked with over the course of a couple of years. It was quite a challenge because we started with them before COVID, but we did the a, a lot of the improvement work and um, after the after picture uh, during COVID. So it made for a, a, a time consuming exercise. But uh, Matt, any, um, do you want to at this point do a- uh, um, Another survey, yep, I think that would be great. Go ahead. Can you put another one up? Oh, and this was, if you're selecting a new system, is there a time frame? Right. And if the answer is we're not, you know, just say it's all, you know, long time out there. All right. So don't know. So again, you know, if you're not on, you know, if don't know is because we're not really looking for a new system. That's one way of it, um, answering this. If it's a, yeah, we'd like to, but we maybe don't have the budget approved, some of this utilization assessment might be helpful um, and fit assessment. And this company here might be, you know, might hit home. Um, let me blow that up just a little bit. So this, this company shall remain nameless, use a, an ERP system. It's a small market system called Intuitive from a, a vendor called Aptian. 
Um, this company happened to be on the latest version of the software, and, but they were very frustrated with what I'll call the supply chain and manufacturing functions. They felt comfortable with accounting, which is common. Uh, they felt comfortable with taking orders and creating purchase orders and shipping and receiving things, but everything in between the transformation process and the planning process and the scheduling process, they were uncomfortable with, even to the point that 12 years after having bought it, they knew they were probably not using it effectively, but they were getting to the point where they were so frustrated, they said they might just throw it out and start over. And so we said, look, it, on the surface, you look like a pretty good fit for Intuitive. Let's, let's see if the problem is just one of utilization. Well, sure enough, they were on the latest version and we showed a score of 91.9%. That's pretty darn good, an A minus when uh, in the grading scale uh, my old high school used. And since they're on the latest version, there's no benefit to upgrading. This is what they would get if they upgraded to the latest version. That's why these two columns are the same. This is their level of utilization of the system, a whopping 24%. And I wanna emphasize that's not 24% of the whole system. That's 24% of the features they agreed after hearing us explain it to them that they should be using. In other words, 24% of what they agreed with was required. You'll notice 0% utilization in scheduling, only a third in how they control their production and work with work orders. The, really from a manufacturing standpoint, the only thing they were doing well was they had their process routing set up and they had their bills of material and items set up. So they did the foundation, they, built the, they dug the basement and poured the concrete, but they never built the house. And so they really had nothing to live in. So that's the, the before picture. If you drill down a little bit in detail, you can see that, you know, just in sales order, uh, they're 0% fit in sales order promising, 0% fit in how they fulfill sales orders, 0% not fit, I'm sorry, 0% utilization in how they do forecasting. Even though the system can do 86.5% of what they now know they should be using. And so when we, so that was taken, that snapshot was taken in mid to late 2018. We worked with them throughout 2019. COVID unfortunately hit in early 2020, if you recall, but we got back in there in the middle of 2020 to do a, an after picture. And you'll notice here that the software is still a 92% fit. I still don't know why it's rounding from 91.9 to 92.0, but you know that's just math and, and reporting tools. But notice their level of utilization is now going, at, at that point gone up to over 70%. Still a C minus, but a heck of a lot better. And you notice all the colors disappearing. More importantly, what the, the um, president or COO of the business said to us was, my God, Scott, I had dreaded the day that we had to replace our system. He said, we're actually making good use out of it. And our pager isn't going off as often. People are actually communicating through the system. And I thought that was a really good anecdotal piece of, of evidence that their level of satisfaction was have, uh, good. We still haven't turned on scheduling. Um, this audit was, gosh, it was close to two years ago. Um, they've been busy with the, the post COVID upsurge. The last I talked to them, they said, are you kidding me? Um, we've doubled in business. Our backlog is like 365 days. He said, I don't have time to do any system initiatives right now. Give me a call later this year. So, but the point is they've at least gotten to a point where they're not limping. They're, they're using the system well, and the scorecard showed it. So that's the idea of putting Harrington's, you know, you, you measure something, it will tend to improve but I wanted to show, and we'll show you some tools about how we you know, got there with them. And I'm gonna close all the tabs and go back to the PowerPoint. Um, so, and I'll, oh, and I'll show you how we got there um, with another client. So, um, and let me put this into, so we've often joked that, you know, Excel or ERP is an Excel replacement program. And, but if you're using, calling it ERP, without doing the requirements planning, you're mainly just running accounting software. 
And we would suggest you just go buy the cheapest thing available like QuickBooks. Um, we actually borrowed this, uh, most of this data from one of the big consulting firms, I think it was Deloitte, that said that most companies are very, are in the, uh, are 43% are very dissatisfied, fairly dissatisfied or neutral with their software. And of that 43%, for about half failed to even implement their software. They scuttled the project. So with a 57% success rate, you know, this is risky business. And there's a lot of um, unsatisfied companies out there as measured by they uh, went over their timeline, they delivered less than expected benefits or they went over budget. Hey, Scott. Reason, yeah, go ahead, Ron. Just on that prior panel, um, is there a, like a top 10 reasons why companies uh, fail gonna, to implement? Yeah, I'm going to get to that right now, actually. Oh, yeah? okay. I don't know if it's Good. top 10, but yep. So <laughs> the big thing is, one of the biggest ones is that over time, maybe initially they bought software that doesn't fit them, square peg for a round hole. But oftentimes, if they have a round peg and a round hole, the size of the hole or the dimensions of the hole changes. And what we mean is the, the goalposts got moved, the requirements change. We, what started like a small gap becomes a big gap. And let's talk about why. The biggest reason that we have seen, and these are actual live client examples over the last 20 years, is the company business model changed. We had an assembler who backward integrated and added injection molding. And all of a sudden their system didn't do things that a, mold, that a molding business needs. We had a distributor acquire a manufacturing business. Distribution software, and they own distribution software that just didn't do manufacturing. Um, job shop manufacturer launched its own product line where now we need engineering change control, configure price quote, you know, a whole slew of make to stock features that a job shop isn't concerned with. Um, we had one client that was a capital uh, equipment manufacturer added a service uh, and repair business and their system didn't do service and repair orders or scheduling, didn't have a geek squad module, if you will. Um, this was the most odd one. We had a large multinational metal processor whose private ownership decided to get into electronics business. Completely different line of business, as well as expanding into South Korea, um, Latin America, and I think somewhere in the Middle East. So, I mean, foreign language requirements, all kinds of currency requirements got levied upon them, in addition to electronics manufacturing. So, as your business expands and as the ownership gets great ideas to forward integrate, backward integrate, it's going to throw new requirements onto um, your ERP system. Those darn customers change their demands. They want their own special labels, their own special documents. They want uh, C of A's and C of C's. They want more traceability. They want industry specific compliance. Uh, one of our food industry clients right now is dealing with something called GS1 labeling um, that was new to them and is, is relatively new to the industry. Um, maybe it's consignment inventories or electronic commerce or e, uh, EDI. So customers, you know, uh, have, a, have a way of levying requirements on us that impact the business systems. Um, the regulators in Washington, Columbus, where have you, also, or industry specific like AIAG, the EPA, USDA, FDA, all of those government, non-government agencies tend to levy requirements on us that are ever changing. Um, Sarbanes-Oxley for the accountants on the, on the call. Um, those tend to impact the denominator. They, they add requirements. The other side is we may lose utilization, meaning our numerator gets worse. And that is with all this turnover and loss of institutional or often called tribal knowledge. Maybe the system was successfully implemented. Back to Ron asking, what are some of the lead reasons? Well, we've all seen this blip of people leaving for retirement, leaving our job, leaving jobs for greener pastures, whatever. That cadre of power users knew how the system ran, but they're no longer available. Maybe they retired or left the company. And so that expertise and experience and knowing where the bodies were buried left with them. 
And so what that leaves companies with all of these together is that maybe the system was implemented without the decision support, just the transaction processing layer that we as our group, despite being an accounting firm, derogatorily call an accounting system. If you're a manufacturing distribution service and repair company, and you start referring to your systems as an accounting system, that's usually a red flag or a yellow flag for us that the goodies, the things that add value maybe aren't being used. Um, all, almost all of our clients today as table stakes can enter orders, send out bills, receive cash, issue purchase orders, receive invoices and pay bills and do accounting. But where we start to see troubles, bills and routings, inventory control, job costing and job processing, and where we really see big problems and opportunities is in the whole configure price quote area. The majority of our clients, even to this day, truth be told, are still using some Excel spreadsheet for these functions, some Excel spreadsheet for engineering change control, and spreadsheets and manual methods and informal brute force methods for all of the things that Apex has been teaching for 30 or 40 years. Um, master production scheduling, MRP, finite scheduling, infinite scheduling, capacity planning. And then all of those things like cycle counting and lot traceability are often left off. So um, there's a lot of value that can be unlocked from existing systems or if their system doesn't offer it by adding these through new, new modules or new, uh, new systems. Um, we see other decision uh, difference makers left on the sidelines. Um, system generated financial reports. Um, we're, we're, we still see a lot of controllers who say you can have my Excel spreadsheets when you pull them from my cold dead hands. And it just shouldn't be a manual exercise to close the books by having um, running reports and then create doing manual journal entries, not in 2022. Um, quality management is another area where we still see a lot of homegrown databases and spreadsheets galore and same with maintenance and even CRM. Mostly what we see is standalone CRM, not integrated. Um, and so as a result, and also one of my favorite lines from the VP of sales at Betcher was I'm tired of seeing my salespeople get blindsided when they go into an account. What he was longing for in a, as a goal for an ERP system was giving his field salespeople insight into the transactions and the data that's going inside the ERP system. Customer complaints, customer returns, uh, status of credit memos, all of those kind of things. And so that's what an integrated CRM can provide a field salesperson. So um, I'm gonna skip over this. These are just some impacts and what we've seen, you know, how these manifest themselves uh, kind of signs that a system has been partially implemented, poorly implemented, or, the, or just is not fulfilling the requirements. Um, functionality gaps, these are, they manifest, the gaps tend to manifest themselves in four ways. Functionality gaps are those features that the software doesn't provide for us. It lacks distribution package, lacks manufacturing features, for example. How do we close those without replacing our system, maybe an upgrade. Maybe we add on modules that we didn't buy originally. Maybe we find an independent software vendor who's written some add-ons or we bolt on Salesforce or a scheduling package. We use workflow management tools like ServiceNow or Knowledge Sync. Um, we write some customizations in the systems tool set. Worst case or second to last worst case is we have the vendor modify the code to fit us but always a last resort, kind of like surgery from a doctor's perspective is a replacement. It's expensive, it's upheaval, and it's one you, something you don't wanna do but every 10 or 20 years. Um, utilization gaps. This is, we've got capabilities, but we aren't using them. Maybe a, we had an accounting driven implementation and let operations and sales off the hook. We see that a lot. Um, maybe we, we just have a, a, a penchant for using Excel um, maybe we just like to work in silos without sharing information, or we lack the foundational knowledge that professional societies like Apex, now the uh, ASCM call, uh, provide. 
Um, utilization gaps are often behavioral or knowledge. So sometimes it's just enlightenment, illuminate that there's idle features. Perhaps the people that are working in the functions today weren't here for the original training and don't know. Um, they're, they're truly just ignorant of it. Get some foundational education classes through your community college or APEX or um, the AICPA, whatever it is. Um, get some formal training. Big difference between education, which is about conceptual knowledge, and training, which is what buttons do I push? I know how MRP works. I just don't know how it works in my ERP system. I know how the theory of scheduling, I just don't know how to set it up in my system. That's the difference between education and training. They're both required. Um, it's not Training isn't sufficient, education isn't sufficient, you need them both. Um, we were big fans of recommending and, and rewarding completion and certainly adopting where there's a will, there's a way. Don't let the easiest thing for any employee to do is do something in a spreadsheet. Don't let them get away with that. The last two gaps types are big picture, structural gaps. We've seen this happen where a company acquires a, an entity and has a sister company now, but the system is not a multi-company, multi-entity system, or they acquire or build a new plant and they don't have a multi-plant system. These type of things, there are workarounds, but they're short-term at best. And they're often an indicator that you don't have a system that will scale as you want to for your business. So inevitably, replacement will be warranted. Um, and that's eventually what Betcher did, um, going back to that old example two decades ago. Um, structural gaps are also things like multi-currency and language, maybe complex financial setups, or missing cost uh, models. These are not things that you want to customize. These are things that if your system doesn't do it, the cost to customize it might run the cost of replacement or run close to. So you want to get away from that. Um, and so, and then the last one is a technology gap. These are situations where the software just hasn't kept up with a modern world. It doesn't integrate with Amazon and Shopify because Amazon and Shopify weren't written or weren't available in the 90s when our software was written. It doesn't interact and dump data to Excel, which is perfectly fine, or interact with Outlook, allowing me to save emails to my ERP system. Maybe it's just running slowly. We ran into this a lot during the work from home craze because companies didn't have a, a web-based system that could run through a, a light footprint browser. Again, like structural gaps, technology gaps um, tend to re warrant replacement at some point. There's some stopgap solutions that I've listed here that, you know, if you want a copy of the presentation, but more often than not, if you've got technological gaps, it's time to get on a replacement roadmap. Doesn't mean tomorrow, but certainly in, in months or a or few years, not uh, decades. We've also found that modernizing can be via upgrade or new system purchase can actually increase adoption and utilization. And it's because of familiarity with screens. This lower diagram is actually a screenshot from one of our clients' uh, ERP systems. I had them log on and show me a screen. You can see it's web-based. It integrates with Google Maps. It's got you know nice tab across the top. It's very modern. Same thing with this Windows 11-based system that has tiles and things that we're you know becoming accustomed to. You know, throw a, throw a character-based AS400 or System 36 system at a millennial or a Gen Z, and they're going to look at you confused because they've never worked with those kind of tools. Throw a web-based system at them, and they'll take to it like a duck to water. So where do we go from here? We have built a, I want to show you in the last five minutes or so, a case study um, where we helped a client that's a powdered metal manufacturer in Western PA using our ERP navigator tool. It's at mmpackageselection.com. I'm gonna log in here. Certainly not gonna take you all the way through everything we did with them, but we we designed this tool to meet our methodology. Ron, uh, Matt, do you have a question to throw in? Uh, the only <clears throat> other one we had was, you know, if 
which modules were people interested in. <clears throat> Go ahead. You want to throw right, that let's do the last poll in. Just note, depending on how your screen is, you might have a scroll bar because there are 10 options and it's multiple okay. choice. <clears throat> And I'm, I'm good to go five or 10 minutes long because I know we got a, a five minute, uh, we're a little slow to start. So if, if anyone wants me to go longer, I certainly can, but I'll try to wrap it up here uh, at one o'clock. So that's good. Common scheduling, that's common. We see that a lot. It looks like everybody, quite a number of people checked a number of options. So very good. Okay, good to go. Oh, you were muted, Matt. Am I? I hope I'm not. Muted. Yep, good to go. Good, okay. So we we took that methodology that we had evolved over from 2001 to 2015 or 16. And in 2016, we decided to do an internal development exercise to build our own framework around it in a web-based environment. And so when we work with a client, this is an actual live client over in St. Mary's PA um, and, and in Gallatin PA. And we start off with a kickoff meeting, which is to elicit all of those challenges that we just talked about. Tell us about your organizational structure and are you planned to expand? Because we know that's gonna impact your ERP system, either a new one or an upgrade or your level of utilization. Tell us about your customers and markets. This one happened to be 42% automotive, which gave us a hint into EDI requirements, packaging requirements, whatnot. Tell us about your products and services and your manufacturing processing technologies, your raw material capability or uh, characteristics. Then once we got the, the big picture, you know, and understanding their business challenges and the business they operate in, their strategies, then we got into their goals and objectives. Notice these aren't, I need, I need a bill of material that has a scrap factor. These are things like we need more accurate bills and routings because we don't know our recipes. Um, we need better integration between engineering and manufacturing. While we were there, this is a horror story. They made a hundred thousand parts of the wrong revision because the engineering change notice was in the engineering system and no one in manufacturing got alerted that the revision had been changed. 100,000 parts got scrapped. And they said, yes, we need better integration. So you get the idea. Um, then we did a very high level scope. What does ERP mean for you? Notice here, things like CRM were taken out of scope with 0% weight. So for them, not important. For other clients, very important. We also took human capital management out of scope, which is payroll and HR, because they don't, um, they're using ADP for their payroll service. But even within things like uh, engineering, project management and project accounting was not in scope and a product configurator not in scope, but we put a lot of weight, 5% of our whole project decision and, and criteria on product master data, which included that engineering change control. Once we got that, then we surveyed their business. This is where we get into the nitty gritty of things like, I like this is one of my favorite ones because it's something that most businesses can relate to. Do we wanna have purchase requisitions in our ERP system? I'm gonna flip back to the original scorecard. Yes, that's required. Yes, our current system does it, but we aren't using it. So how important is it? Yes, no, relative weight. Do we have that capability today? Well, we asked them to peer into their system. Yes, we do. And, they're, and we, they agreed with us, you ought to be doing that. And the reason for that was today they're doing their, their requisitions through email. And it, we found that the, the data, or every time that some raw material is needed, the data is entered three times. 
yet the people in planning and purchasing are complaining they're overworked. Now, is this going to turn red ink into black ink? No, but if your people feel overworked and they're not and they're doing triplicate data entry, that's one way one way of uh, to alleviate some of their pain. ERP utilization is is often death by a thousand cuts. There isn't one silver bullet, but there are many bullets that if you fire them, you can knock things down. So, so that's an example of how what we did for them. And what I wanted to show you was, let me pick the right. We say, for example, a working list was show me everything that we weighted as required or strategically required in our package that our package can do that we aren't using. Current use is no. This was our working list that we started with. He said, guys, these are all the things you agree. Look at this long list. <laughs> you agree with us, you should be doing these things. You said you agreed with us it's required and your system visual does it, but you aren't using it. And I think there was 112 of them. So that's just a, guys, we gotta go get trained and start using it. What we found with this company was well, yes, Visual can do it, but we don't own some of this software, like EDI. We don't own the purchase requisition module. In this particular case, we ended up getting a price tag of 150,000 to do improvement. And that's when they said, mm, maybe we ought to look at new software. But my point being, at least we had a roadmap. And then we went on to do other things like just look at other comparative vendors. But my point being, we've provided a tool for them to do a working list to knock out all of the things that they couldn't do. We also gave them a list of potential customizations where they could get the vendor to quote things to customize the software to close gaps. Um, so that's just a, a snippet of how we do those. Um, what we did show them was their fit was initially that they owned everything um, was greater than 80%, it was like 92. So we said the software is okay to keep, your level of utilization was less than 70%. We're gonna take a re-engineering approach to get you guys on the right path. But if your level, is a, a level of utilization is between 70 and 90, that's when we'll usually turn them loose and let them monitor it themselves and maybe do an audit every couple of years. So that takes you through the analysis the planning, the roadmaps. I've thrown a lot at you. Um, what we did when we got to step six with that client was we found that the total cost of the initiative was more than they wanted to spend on what was relatively old software and visual. But, and that's why we, you know, you want to get the plan first, then determine, you know, what is it, what are our specs, then what's it going to cost? That's a rarity. Most often the cost is much less than the cost of a replacement. And so therefore we'll you know, keep with it. Big point here that I wanna consider is don't forget that internal cost. We have found that for every dollar our clients spend in it outside services, be it with us or typically more often with the software vendor, they'll spend five to 10 hours uh, of internal time. And that's why these initiatives are so hard to do because no one's sitting around with, with time on their hands. So that's why we always instruct our clients, consider the opportunity costs. Are there other competing capital projects that are gonna suffer because people are gonna be dedicated to this initiative and make sure that those people aren't deployed on all those other projects um, and being forced to work two shifts. Um, and then the last thing is once you've got the costs aligned, then it's you know move on to implementation and go ahead and do it. There's many approaches. You could do it yourself tends to be time consuming and expensive. Consultant driven tends to be very expensive. So what we tend to see is a combo approach. Um, certainly wanna develop a timeline and a budget. Always have one of these as part of these major initiatives. A change management methodology, how you go about deploying new modules. Notice here, educate the team on how the software works, then train the team on how the configured version of that software is going to be deployed and used according to our operating procedures 
and our future state process flow diagrams. And that's done through simulating the software in a laboratory or war room, and then doing a dress rehearsal before you cut over and go live. Um, and so the last bit before I move, you know, kind of close things out is there's is the technology paradox. Don't forget about that. As you educate your team, as you train them, you'll find that they're more talented. But ask yourself, which person in this is working harder and who gets paid more? As you educate your team, they're gonna be using equipment, using my analogy here, more effectively, they're gonna be more productive. You may have to share some of the gains with them as opposed to the ditch digger here. Um, so takeaways, we believe in measuring your ERP systems fit and utilization like any other major asset in the company. Um, adjust the requirements fit and utilization annually or every other year. Um, use your work procedures and process maps to institutionalize the use of your ERP and CRM systems. Make sure that people are adhering to those. Um, recognize the impact of the internal and external changes. Um, boss goes out and buys a new business. I, one of my favorite examples was we were kicking off a project with a client and they said, no, no, we've been in Pittsburgh forever. We're going to stay here. And Mark and Steve, the two brothers who ran the company said, well, I guess it's time we come clean. We're about to buy a plant in Poland. Well, that's going to have a huge impact on the software we're about to go start improving work on. So, um, and a, a, good me a good rubric or metric to follow is invest in as much in education and training as you do the software. So if the software upgrade is 50 grand, budget 50 grand for education and training. That will serve you well. And it, it, uh, because without doing that, we're left with what is often called shelfware, software that works well, but nobody's using. Um, and so, um, and then it's the last commercial message about us. Um, we celebrated our 100th anniversary right before COVID hit at the Rock Hall, so a Cleveland-based firm. And, uh, but we haven't been doing technology consulting since 1918, I'll assure you. Um, <laughs> and we are an independent consulting firm in that we don't take, we don't represent any software and we don't take finder's fees or commissions from the vendors we recommend, so. And that is it other than a wrap up and, and happy to answer any questions. Well, thanks a lot, Scott. Um, I think we lost a couple manufacturers that were on. Uh, they okay. probably had to go at one for other commitments. Probably go put out the fires, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But uh, thank you again. Um, you know, really appreciate the approach. The methodical approach takes kind of the emotion out of okay. some of the decisions you have to make and maybe some of the issues that are happening. And um, we'll take that a wrap. And uh, we appreciate it. All right. So I am going to stop the recording and we'll freeze it there.